Great. Welcome, everyone, to the uh, part two of a session that we started yesterday looking at different ways of teaching and practice in synchronous sessions. Uh, we're very pleased to have Karen Hyder join us again today to share uh, some of her experiences, and they are considerable, having spent 15-plus uh, years in developing individual skills and talents to be effective instructors in synchronous sessions. As more of higher education starts to improve the richness of the learning experience for students by providing immersive learning or using a video and related technologies to communicate these experiences. This is a particularly relevant activity, I think, for all of us to be able to engage in and to have a better sense of what does it look like from a practice perspective? How do we become effective and engaging synchronous instructors? And I can't think of anyone more capable of helping that transition uh, than uh, Karen. So Karen, over to you. Look forward to the session. <laughs> Thanks so much, George. Yeah, I can be kind of nerdy about this stuff, can't I? I could really talk about this all day. And for those of you who were in the session yesterday, I think you probably noticed that I really love this software tool. Actually, I have a love-hate relationship with it. But there's so much flexibility to it. There's so much that we can do, including things like this map application that you see here. And I'm just going to paste a URL for you here in chat. This is meant to broaden your understanding of this software interface and what it can do. And what you'll see on that site is a bunch of little aftermarket add-ins like this map. Now, I will say this about them. When the versions of the software change, it's typical that these little applications break <laughs> because they are aftermarket apps that people create and then post and let others use them for free. But when the, when the software changes, those apps then need to be updated. But you can use the Adobe API and create little apps like this. And there are people out there who do that for a, a business. So just to open your eyes to what possible here. I'd like to welcome everybody back to our second session. If you missed yesterday's session, I encourage you to go back and look at the recording. We covered a lot of basic ideas, basic tools, basic features of Adobe Connect, and basics of teaching online. And I think that you probably noticed that there's a technique that I like to use that we used over and over again yesterday that is my best advice to anybody adopting virtual classroom tools. If you remember what that thing was that I did or that technique that I'm encouraging you to adopt, go ahead and type in chat. What do you think I'm referring to here? <laughs> Certainly, interaction is at the core of it, Nori. We need to create interaction to see our learners online. With no interaction, with no feedback, with no comments, with no responses to questions, I can't see my students. I can't see that they're out there. Actually, the language I was really looking for, and I'm going to switch screens here for a second. Oops, that's not the one I wanted to show you now, but there's my webcam, so I'll let you uh, laugh at that for a minute. But I'm going to switch screens here and show you some slides that we were looking at yesterday. And this is the same slide deck that we uh, downloaded. And if you missed it yesterday, or if you'd like to download this slide file, I've transferred the file into this files pod in the lower right corner of the screen. So you can download that file from that location. It is quite large. It's about 25 meg. So you might want to hold off until uh, later to get it. But you can just click the file name, click on download now, and get access to this PowerPoint. It will open a second browser window. So you'll need to go to that browser to get access to the download button.
great. I'm so glad that you are embracing that idea of multiple chat pods. I think that is something that's very cool here. Also, it's, it can be time efficient. You know, if I'm asking you for advantages and disadvantages at the same time, you can answer both questions at the same time. I don't have to do them in a linear way, like I might need to if I were using a tool like, for instance, WebEx. I'd have to ask the first question, wait for all the answers, then ask the second question. Otherwise, the questions get in and answers get all mixed together. Yeah, so I see your examples coming in here of the types of questions you could ask, and I want you to keep working on those. Every time you feel like you want to show a bulleted list, think, how could I ask a question that would get my par participants to give me this bulleted list? And don't do things like give a bulleted list and then say, what else? That's like wringing a sponge. You already gave me all the good bullets, and now you're just asking me to come up with the obscure bullets. So don't give away the bullet first. Ask, what do you think this list is going to include? What do you think are the best features of Connect? I don't need to tell you. Yeah, OK, great. And Fred, I see your comment there, but honestly, I can't process that right now because I want to get into content a little bit deeper. But when I get you started on the next activity, I promise to go back and read that. So as I'm reviewing the things that we were talking about yesterday, I also want to review that concept that waiting for answers is crucial. It's so easy for participants to be multitasking in an online session. And if you ask a question and then quickly move on, you're teaching them that your questions are rhetorical. And once you do that, it's easy for your voice to become the white noise in the background as they go on with their Facebook posting or their whatever it is that they're doing when they're not really paying attention to your session. And we're really looking for that engagement. So if you ask a question and wait for responses, I think you'll find that the dynamics of your presentation or your instructional interactions will change. Participants will become more vocal. They'll become more willing to speak up, to answer questions, to ask questions. So once they feel comfortable typing in chat, once they feel like they're not sort of out on a limb by typing in chat, then they kind of start to blurt things out, which has advantages and disadvantages. Sometimes the blurting can be distracting, but sometimes it's really telling. And it's the same kind of stuff we would have heard people muttering under their breath or whispering to a colleague sitting next to them in the physical classroom. So that waiting is crucial. And I think if you attended the session yesterday, you remember that our wait times kind of hovered around the 30 to 60 mark for most people. Actually, let me see if I can bring that poll back. Uh, the menus in here are just a little bit slippery, so sometimes it's hard to open something from the menu. I like to have things staged on that right side ahead of time. So, oh, a lot of people yesterday said between 15 and 30 seconds was about the, the right wait time, and it might be. But it does take people time to type. And here in Adobe Connect, when you're logged in as a presenter and a host, you can see a little prompt at the bottom of the chat pod when somebody is typing. So you can see if there's a question coming in. During that moment when you're waiting, I encourage you to do this. Mute your mic, sip your water, put on some chapstick if you need to, take a breath, <laughs> and then read what's been going on in chat the last couple minutes. Don't jump on them immediately as, as the answers start coming in. Use those crucial moments for yourself, because you don't get a lot of moments when you're online for 60 straight minutes. You can hear how quickly I'm talking right now. You can hear how how... I might get breathless if I let myself keep going at this pace. So that's the moment for you as a trainer, you as a presenter, to stop and breathe. Use it. And mute your mic, because we don't want to hear you uh, drinking your water or uh, taking a deep breath. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and get rid of this poll. I'm just using the hide function from the menu there in that poll. And also yesterday we were talking about that concept of prompting for participation, the idea that it's super helpful to participants if you actually put the question and how you want them to respond 
right down the screen. So notice how I did this one. I used animations in PowerPoint to control when that came in. So I could talk a little bit about the idea of prompting and then show you the prompt at the moment when I wanted to ask the question. This reminds me Great. Great. And I see your answers coming in there. Yeah, there's some tough ones there. And some, some of the things may not translate very well to the virtual environment. They may still make the most sense in the physical environment. And that's what we would then start calling a blended approach. You don't just do it one way. You have multiple modalities. Maybe it makes more sense asynchronously. Maybe it makes more sense using a different interface. So we're not just saying that virtual classroom is the answer to all the physical classroom questions or, or content, but it's also worth getting creative and thinking about that. Like, how do you replicate a lab? Well, maybe we don't replicate it live. We replicate it using virtual machines that participants can log into the week between the sessions. And then once they post those items, the the producer or the, the facilitator goes and looks at those. Yeah, I mean, there are going to be some challenges here. Once you start thinking about uh, science experiments and so forth, of course, they're going to have to go to a real lab. You're not going to mail them chemicals to mix up at their laptop there. So there are going to be some issues. Video can be a great substitute for, for uh, live demos of things. You could be having people watch video files ahead of time or view the materials ahead of time, like, like one example here, sending the PowerPoint points ahead of time and letting them review those. So yeah, it's not easy. I encourage you to brainstorm with your team and get creative about what's possible here. But as long as we're talking about prompting and about questions, I want you to think about the questions I've been using in this program. Remember, at the beginning, I used that, uh, actually, if you weren't in the first session, you didn't see this one, but I asked a question that kind of helped me help you <laughs> see where you were. So if you have to self-proclaim, um, it's useful for the trainer to know that, to know where you're coming from, and it's useful for you to claim that. It's also useful for the other people in the group to know where they stand. Um, am I one of the advanced students, or am I one of the slow students? And remember yesterday, we also used the poll about, will you agree to participate? This, for me, is crucial to virtual classroom success. Because if my participants don't even know that I expect them to participate, or if they're thinking, oh, great, I have a webinar. That means I can clean my desk, or I can uh, you know, write those emails that I've been procrastinating on, because it'll just be a background noise kind of thing. Right now, I'm making the expectations really clear. I'm here. I'm delivering content. Are you with me or not? If you're not, it's up to you. But I can't physically control you. I can't use my, my classroom techniques like standing over your shoulder glaring at you. So I have to get you to uh, take accountability for your own actions. And that's what this is about. I encourage you to use that. And then when participants decide to be you know, slow to respond, or maybe they disappear into Facebook, you can remind them, hey, remember at the beginning when you agreed to participate? I meant like now, like this, this kind of an interaction here. So you can bring it back around to them. But beyond that, polling can be functional to get people moving in the right direction when it comes to content. So I'm not just talking about administrative elements. I'm talking about I'm teaching Excel now. And if I'm going to teach you Excel, I need to get you to 
think about which of these ways of doing things is the correct way. There's plenty of wrong ways. So if I include a poll within my demonstration of Excel, I would have it look like this. So I would say to the audience members, okay, we're going to do this, and which of these things do you think is the right way of doing it? And then, of course, we talk about what is the right way and move on from there. But that has to be scripted, because if you only thought about that on the fly, you wouldn't have had a poll ready for it. So if you're going to use something like that, you really need to think about it ahead of time. What's the question? What are the answers? How are you going to get them to respond? How will you make it clear? that you really want an answer? And then what will you do with that information once you move on? So I'd like you to share an example of a poll question you might ask. Go ahead and type in your questions and then a few possible responses before you hit send. So use chat, and I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. I'll expose that other pod later on. But I'm looking for those types of questions that are suited to a poll, something that does have a finite number of possible responses. And remember from yesterday, I showed you a poll that had many, many, many possible responses. I've had as many as 60 poll responses before, well, we just ran out of possible answers. It was, which of these software tools have you used? And we had 60 of them and had participants responding. So you're not limited in the poll and how you use it, but you are limited in that you can only ask one question at a time. If, if you wanted to ask three questions, you need three separate poll pods. But that's OK, because we know we can put poll pods side by side and show those all to the participants at the same time. And I'll show you an example of that. Uh, as soon as everybody stops typing. I don't want to cut you off while you're typing there. So another nice thing about polls, especially in contrast to this free form open-ended chat or verbal contributions to the conversation, polls also serve as a way to let the participants stay anonymous. So I might want to use a poll because I don't want people to see each other's answers or be influenced by each other's answers. There is such a setting in polls that allow you to, and let me just give you an example of this. It allows you to collect data as short answers. So And I apologize for the crudeness of the question here, but notice this poll is essentially anonymous because you can type your answer to the question, what's your favorite color? But until I click broadcast, nobody sees the answers at all. And nobody sees who answered which way, except for me as the presenter or the host of the software. So I can see, I can click view votes, and I can see who voted which way. So if you'd indulge me there for a minute, go ahead and type your answer in the pod that says, what's your favorite color? And this is the third type of polling question. We can have multiple choice, multiple answer, or short answer. In each case, the presenter or host can see who votes which way, but the participants don't see that. So it is anonymous. Great. Always changing. OK, so I'm going to broadcast the results now. And you can still see that people answered, but you can't see who answered which way. All right, we're going to move on from this poll. I'm just going to hide that and move on through my slides. So what was my first poll? Actually, it wasn't today, but yesterday. Do you remember my first poll about getting agreement? Again, this is part of my administrative setup for my session, something I incorporate in my sessions so that I can get on the right footing with the participants. I don't care if you participate or don't participate. Just let me know where we stand, because those names in the list are people to me. And if you're not really there, I need to know that. Some trainers will say, I'm going to be calling on you, so you better look alive. And I am not a fan of that technique, because I think if you want to participate, that's up to you. I don't want to bully you into it. Now, there is a tool. Oops, let me go ahead here. There is a tool that is kind of underrated, I think. It's the set status function at the top of the screen. Great for binary polling, great for impromptu polling. Things like, can you hear me, yes or no? Of course, if they couldn't hear you, they couldn't answer that. So you've got to type that question in chat. But you also have other reasons you might want to use this. Like, I might want to say, if you're ready to volunteer, 
show hand raised. If you're ready to test your audio, if you're ready to turn on your microphone, if you're ready to start application sharing, if you're ready to step up and play driver to my shared application demonstration, I need you to show hand raised so I can pick you out of that list. And once I pick you out of the list, then I can use my menu to give you privileges. I could upgrade you to host. I could give you what are called enhanced participant rights that we saw last time that lets you do things like draw or application share. And of course, there's that ever popular, are you hearing me? Because we do need to ask that question a lot. I like the feature that says step away. So you don't have to tell me when you're going and coming back. When you show step away, that tells me you took a call, you're distracted, you're getting coffee, you're in the restroom. Great. I won't assume that you're there. And if we're going into breakout groups, I won't put you in one because you're going to come back and not know what's going on. So that step away function is a great thing to teach the participants to use when they are stepping away to go on break or whatever it might be. And there's these other ones that are a little more fun. I love to some, somehow figure out how to get Bunny into my presentations just because I'm a fan of bunnies. But you find yourself saying ridiculous things then because you say, if you think that was funny, show the laughter icon. You know, you, sh you shouldn't have to do that. Jerry Seinfeld would never do that. Or how's our pace so far? If you'd like to see a change, show rabbit or turtle. These do not roll off of anybody's tongue. These are silly things to say that we find ourselves saying in the virtual classroom. And I say, embrace it. Just get used to it. This is how we talk to each other here now. We talk about things like not raise your hand, but set your status to raise hand. Not say yes or no. Change your status to green check mark or red X. So our verbal messages now will all have to shift. It does take some getting used to. Thinking about that multiple pod function that we talked about earlier, here's an example that I pulled from a session that Frank Nguyen did a couple years ago that I really loved and I think is a great example of using multiple pods without overwhelming the audience. And I'm showing to these to you in the sequence which Frank showed them to the audience. So he was asking a question related to instructional design and he was wanting to collect feedback from the participants in these three areas, history of the company, customer service, and common issues. So he thought about how do we get the workers to work together or to learn before, during, and after the physical or the online training program. So he delivered each of the three pods, I'm sorry, each of the nine pods three at a time. So the participants would see them and respond and then see the next grouping and respond. This took a little bit of setup because it took managing nine pods, actually 10 if you include the PowerPoint that was the backdrop. But look at how clean that is and look at how that is set up so participants can easily respond. If you were doing this in the physical classroom, you might have done this on multiple whiteboards or chalkboards or flip charts. Here, we're giving people a confined space in which to answer. You don't have to micromanage this, just set it up and let them have at it. And remember, mute your mic and breathe because that's going to be the only chance you get. So I'm going to pause here and let you just take a look at what this is and see if there's anything maybe between one chat pod at a time and nine at a time that you could adopt. Could you use this in one of the activities in your program? Is there a place that something like this makes sense?
In my benevolent dictatorship, all users would have fiber optic cabling running to their homes and businesses. They would have the best internet connection in the world. And fantastic headsets, microphones, all wired, nothing wireless. But I do not live in a benevolent dictatorship. So I can't control the network. I am at the mercy of the network, and so are you. And so are your participants. So what we can do is do our best. Try to stay connected with a wire rather than using wireless. Shut down system resources that you don't need. If you've got Dropbox and RSS feeds and everything open, close them down. If you're receiving mail messages during the session, close that down. Downloading videos, uploading stuff, don't do it while you're in the session. Put all of your resources into getting the data that you need. So <laughs> if you can do that, then that's a step in the right direction. Secondarily, though, get used to it. If you expect your audio to be 100% perfect, it's not going to be, and you're going to be disappointed. If you lead people to believe that their audio is going to be 100% perfect, they're not going to see that, and they'll be disappointed. So like when you use Skype or when you download a movie and you watch a movie when it's still caching, it hiccups. That's the reality of dealing with the networks that we're dealing with. So don't get all bent out of shape. Come up with, instead, some solutions. So if you didn't hear me, Oh, I have a, a prompt on the screen right there that makes it clear what it is you're supposed to do. So even if you couldn't hear me because my audio cut out, the information is on screen. Or send the file to the participants ahead of time. So even if they couldn't um, follow you through every portion of the session, they can follow you on the file. And of course, you can record sessions. So if they got disconnected or hung up or their audio wasn't working, they could play the recording later. So thinking in terms of plan B and plan C for not only delivery but use of your material will help you cover your bases. Because it's not a perfect world, it's not a perfect network. So in the absence of perfection, we've got band-aids, <laughs> you know, we've got solutions. But you know, when you think about those disasters that we've seen in online, some of them are un unavoidable. If you're running your webcam and you're expecting voice over IP to be 100% clear, you're not going to be satisfied because the webcam takes up a lot of your system resources and your network resources. So consider that. And once you start having more than one webcam showing, it's just exponential. So you've got more and more data flowing in multiple directions and you jam people up. So is it crucial that you can see people on a webcam? Or is it fine that you just have photos or some other version of that? You could even use the webcams momentarily and then pause. So I want to switch gears a little bit here and talk about that sort of preparation for that, preparation for getting it right. How do you make sure that you get it right? And I've been doing this for 15 years. And believe me, I've gotten it wrong a lot of times. And I know that I also cannot rest on my laurels from one session to the next. I must do the same amount of preparation and, and foreshadowing in each session because I have no idea what it's going to be. The other day, I was in a session that, for some reason, the participants' phone conference line would not merge with their login, which doesn't seem like too big a deal until you have to go to breakout rooms. And then their audio and their visual is separate. So then you've got to figure out whose phone number is whose to put them in the breakout groups. Nightmare. I never saw it coming. I didn't know that that would happen. Thankfully, I had a plan B solution, and I'm happy to tell you all about it later on. But I want to talk to you about these five areas that require preparation. Essentially, the person who's delivering the training must be prepared. If you send some new person out on a limb to deliver content in this environment, and they have never used it before or never thought about how to use it before, they will fail. And that's mean. Don't do that to them. Help them. Prepare your trainers, your producers, your, I shouldn't say producer, I mean like facilitators or professors. The people who are trying to deliver the content can't easily also manipulate the technology. Once they get used to it, then maybe. But in, in the beginning, it's very difficult. Of course, the participants need to know what to expect, too. The content should be adapted. I had a client one time that said, hey, Karen, you know, I use WebEx all the time. What's the big deal? I just throw up my PowerPoint slides and talk, and that's it. Then people ask questions. It's like, really? That's, that's it? You just throw up and talk? So we don't really want that. We want 
slides and materials that are designed to work with the resources that you have available. And if you were here in yesterday's session, you remember that we talked about Ruth Clark's quote, and I'm going to go back to it because I think it's important. Oh, I'm close. This one. The research shows that it doesn't matter what media you're using. Just the fact that you are using the media is what matters. So don't just show up and throw up and talk to your participants through this medium. Engage with them. Get them to respond to you, too. And once you get that dynamic, then you're going to enjoy the online experience much more. But until that, you're talking to what feels like an empty room or a silent audience. And people don't really like to do that. So I'd like to shift gears here and show you a different screen. So I'm going to scroll down through my layouts. And that's not the one I want to show you. It's called for, here we go. So I'd like to pause here and ask you to make a couple of lists here. What do you think is required? What do we need to prepare the trainer or facilitator or professor, teacher, whatever you call them? Um, what do you need to prepare them? What do you need to prepare your participants? What do you need to do to your content? And what do you need to do with the software interface, whether it's Adobe Connect or Blackboard or something else? What are you going to need to do before and during the session? So go ahead and type in the five pods that you see on this screen to make a couple of lists for us. And I'm going to move this off to the side a little to make it easier to see. So you've got five pods to type in. Go ahead and type. Okay, so somebody brought up the idea of the students from overseas. I think it's John. And yeah, if your users are on a compromised network connection, one thing you might want to bring the Adobe Connect software room down from the top end setting. If it's set to LAN, set it to, I'm sorry, I don't have it in front of me, the middle setting. So it will push data to the internet uh, at a different rate than if you have it set on the highest setting. So it'll make it easier for them to, to receive that data. And then also, don't max out what you're doing here. Don't show your webcam full time. Don't show videos that are huge. Just you know, keep things sort of limited in how you do it, considering the fact that the people on the other end are going to be on a compromised connection. So even if it's great for you, there's no guarantee that it's going to be great for everybody. Yeah, I like seeing people on the webcam too, and my recommendation would be to just take turns. Have them pause in between, uh, in between their messages so that you're not running those webcams full time. Great. So I see your items coming in here on these checklists. Yeah. OK, yeah, let your helper know what to expect. I hope you have a helper. It can be really useful. Prepare polls and stuff ahead of time. And here in Adobe Connect, the software is persistent, so this room will stay the way it is. 
when we log out. And that's why I still had the poll from yesterday. I still have the chat text from yesterday. I still have the file I uploaded from yesterday. Okay. And I'm going to, just in the interest of time, I'm going to move away from that checklist, but just talk to you a little bit more about the fact that in each of these areas, attention needs to be paid. Do not think that you can overlook what the students need and then expect them to get in and be able to A, log in properly, B, install an add-in if there is one, C, get a headset that's working, D, get their audio functioning. You know, it goes on and on. They do not know how to do these things or they do not know what you expect them to do until you tell them. So you should be having conversations with learners days and weeks in advance, getting technology details sorted out and expectations sorted out. Because if people are logging in at 1 o'clock for a 1 o'clock session, it's pretty late to be troubleshooting any kind of problems they might be having or to be only finding out now that they should be using a, a wired internet connection or a, a headset. So consider these checklists and keep yourself honest. Don't assume that just because last week's session ran well, you don't need to do these things. You need to do these things over and over and over and over again. And then adapt the lists as you learn uh, as far as what needed to be done ahead of time. I have a humongous list <laughs> that I use um, that's just a giant Excel spreadsheet with multiple pages. And it allows me to go down the list and make sure that everything is included. Now remember yesterday we were talking about application sharing in Excel and that would be terrible if you were planning on application sharing in Excel and then you had to cancel it. So consider what would happen if that was the case. You're planning on demonstrating something and then you get there and you can't. The application sharing won't work or something is going wrong there. It's not a bad idea to have a plan B that is just a screenshot like this one. You know, it's kind of uh, ugly, maybe, <laughs> but it's better than not being able to get through that section of the lesson because the technology failed. I'd like you to go into this assuming your technology will fail all the time. Everything you have planned will break. And if you operate with that, then you also will start to think about, okay, when that breaks, then what will I do? If the poll breaks, then I'll punt and I'll go to set status as their
Great. Well, uh, I'll just jump in here and just say uh, thanks very much, Karen, for again uh, inter you know, certainly providing some overview and insight for, for all of us on ways that we can improve and expand the teaching practices that we use in online environments. I think it's been a, an informative and entertaining session and uh, you certainly do an outstanding job modeling the kinds of behavior that uh, you're, you're communicating that are effective in online environments. So thanks again. Uh, for the rest of you that uh, joined in here, I just want to again say thanks for taking the time to uh, spend part of your Friday with us. I will highlight some upcoming events that we have coming up uh, in the URL that was just dropped in the text box. And take care and look forward to chatting with you in the future. Karen, again, thanks for a terrific session. I'll end the recording now.